So um, just to sort of highlight on one point to sort of counter argue that the market has has gone up so much higher than before, right? Um, I would say that no, actually in some area, this market has sort of like some artists in this market, which is very important, has actually sort of depreciated, if I may use the word, you know. Um, I give an example. Uh, Locatelli is one of the artists that's falling very nicely in the group of Indo-European artists we just discussed earlier on. And um, very important, very rare. And um, this is a big canvas work, which was first appear in April 2005 in Singapore. And it was sold for about 900,000 sing. Um, and it was just sold in Hong Kong recently for 6.6 .6 million Hong Kong dollar. And that's about 1 million Singapore dollar. So it has been what? 205 to 2012. So it's really not really an appreciation. And in fact, it was only one or two bidder in the room. So what I'm trying to say that in this market, um, there is a lesser appreciation for a full range of Indo-European artists, which used to be one of the most important um, category in the sections, really one of the like, like stars in the, in the sections. Um, However, I want to say that with the coming out of the Southeast Asian contemporary category, we are seeing more and more, and this is not something that's unique to Southeast Asia, it's one of the characteristics of a lot of contemporary works. It is really a group of works that sort of uh, allow the community, the collecting community to sort of cross over the national boundary a bit more than the modern artist. So we are seeing now a new group of um, younger artists within Southeast Asia, which is um, inev inevitably so, very investment-minded. For some reason, most of them are Chinese, you know, I mean, and Chinese people are very practical-minded, like I'm Singaporean Chinese, so we are all very practical-minded. And usually they are very sensitive to the issue of investment, even though they do come from a very sort of basic need of the love of art and cultural affinity. Many of them are very nationalistic, very proud of Philippines, fiercely proud of Philippines, I would say, many of them, are very proud of being Indonesians. And they travel to buy art, or, and they use internet to buy art and obtain information. And this group of artists have this really quest for getting the first-hand information um, by, by doing their own homework, talking to galleries, museum curators, and auction houses uh, specialists. Then, at the same time, I also see a new group of collectors for uh, beyond Southeast Asia. And um, usually is a concerted collecting effort uh, beyond Southeast Asia on the category, like coming from institutions, art funds, and some individuals. Um, and these collectors, these group of collectors will also be thinking about art as an investment, very much so. And coming from a more mature market, typically, um, for example, Taiwan for me is really a very mature market. When I first came to Taiwan, and um, I felt very happy, for one, because um, they all like to talk to me about art, so that's nice. But it's also equally very stressful, because they are so, um, they're so with it, they're so informed. So it's, the conversation is not like, oh, so uh, what do you think? Huh? What, why do you think um, Master Adi is, is, is like this? But the conversation is like, hey, Master Adi only had one exhibition you know, in his whole lifetime. Why is he having this kind of price? Don't you think it's too high? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's much more informed. They have, they have a concept of what an, a market should make, uh, sorry, uh, what a market should be in terms of the structure in terms of the supporting um, roles like critics, um, writers, journalists. Another typical question I used to have is like um, uh, from the Taiwanese collectors. Okay, first of all, you have to understand that in, in Southeast Asia, generally, generally, is being a very young market. 
um, a lot of the supporting roles are also sort of being developed. By that, I mean maybe um, journalistic writing might not be the most professional in a sense that understanding the trends of the market, but maybe the reporting is coming from a journalist coming to the auction, seeing a big price and reporting on a big price. You know, there's no analysis. So, for instance, if a collector from a mature market coming and read an article and said to me that, oh, in this article, this person says that um, the ink and brush uh, painter of Singapore is going to be the next big trend. I mean, it's very difficult for me to tell him that, hey, this is a journalist of 23 years old, so we're just given the mission to write this thing because there's a conference and Christie's with cakes and drinks, you know, and she has no critical mind. I, I, I'm Singaporean, so I think I'm allowed to say that, but this is generally the standard of art reporting in Singapore. So coming from a market like Taiwan, they, 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 they will be quite dumbfounded to, to, to be sort of to understand that there is really no real art reporting in Southeast Asia in general. I mean, this trend is changing, of course, of course. But, um, you know, it's just not as professional as many other places. And so, so typically, this group of collectors will be asking more for documentation, consistency, exposure, institutional recognitions. And one of the typical questions that they will ask is, um, um, to say that they, are, they like artist A, then they'll ask me, okay, which galleries represent artist A? And I'll be like, uh, hmm, last year he did a show here, and I think he's planning to do a show there next year. <laughs> you know, it's it's just the way is in Southeast Asia at the moment. It's a little bit as one reporter has said, it's a bit of a wild, wild west at the moment, which um, I'll come to it more um, later. So some of the new artists of Southeast Asia, which I think many of you are very familiar with, because these are the cliches. I mean, each time when I do a presentations, I tell myself. I don't want to repeat the cliché, I don't want to entrench the clichés, but unfortunately, it has to be discussed. The images have to be shown and flashed up again, and to be discussed, I hope, in a little bit deeper way than you seeing it on a press release or on a newspaper saying that what kind of prices they made. Masriadi. Everybody talks about Masriadi because of the big prices he has made. His study, five. 36 years old, oh, born 1973, how old is that? And um, he's from Bali originally, but he's not a Balinese artist. I mean, no, okay, I can't say that. He's a Balinese artist, but Bali has no impact on him. He wasn't schooled in Bali, like many of the contemporary artists were schooled in Jogja. So he lived and he works um, out of Jogja presently. This is this is an artist who I've seen for the last 15 years continue to grow, continue to evolve, continue to surprise. And sometimes I think that the success of the auctions is so big for him that in a way it sort of handicapped him. There are many curators or institutional people who came to Jogja and visit and do their curatorial research. And maybe for this sort of revolting thing against money, they don't visit Masriadi. <laughs> and unfortunately, this is at present one of the biggest criticism on Masriadi. I mean, saying that why isn't more curators or museums are coming to visit him and, and thinking that he's very important, you know. But to me, and knowing him a little bit more and uh, personally, I really think that he has a quality of an artist that can walk a very long way. I mean, he has not gotten a studio assistant so far. Um, he was even he was not even tempted. He has a very um, close relationship with his present dealers at the moment, and um, and this sort of close close relationship has also allowed the dealers to work with him in a very exclusive manner and managed to organize and structure his every exhibitions. And um, to me, he has all the making still artistically as, as an artist that's going to make it, not just in terms of the monetary sense, but as an artist who really can have the time to develop his career and the resources to be supported. And then we have Handy Wilman. 
um, another, to me, a very important Indonesian contemporary artist who is really quite something for me to see an image like this coming from an Indonesian artist because they have a very strong figurative um, heritage. It's, 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 a very, it's, it's not a no-no not uh, to pay non-figurative work, but it's not something that they are naturally attracted to. So for an artist like Handy Woman, who is Javanese, um, coming from that culture, and to refute whatever that was taught to him as beautiful is pretty amazing. This is also a works of um, Handy Woman. That's him, Handy. Rona Ventura, another big rock star, but from the Philippines. Rona is interested in the beauty of a naked man body. So that's why he constantly repeats them. That's actually the joke, but no one you get it. Sorry. So, um, well, we have more images of Ronald, which will come back later. Geraldine, a personal friend and very good artist to me, interested in um, very intricate um, aesthetics of things, interested in found objects. The little squares you see are actually found objects and, and taxidermies. Um, and very skilled in her in her in, in, in a painterly technique. Very, very skilled. Nati Utari, a young artist from um, Thailand, who is very familiar with the Western visual um, vocabulary. Eko Nugroho, I'm just gonna quickly run through. Eko Nugroho, very young as you can see, born 1977, uh, belongs, I mean, a very highly representation of a group of artists which is very interested in street art in, in, in Indonesia. Christine Aichu, another young artist from Indonesia. Jose Santos, to me, one of the, one of the more exciting um, Filipino artists that's coming out, which actually um, has been, it's been really well received in the auction market and also in the, in the primary market. But um, because he didn't make the $1 million, so no one really talks about him. Uh, Indie Gorillas, a young Indonesian collective group, that's them, working on the mural work. E. Ilan, again, a personal friend and an artist from Sabah in Malaysia. She, she's, she's a really good artist. <laughs> I mean, she's a really good artist and she really feels for her subject. She is, she is proudly Malaysia, which I'm very proud of because Malaysian art, I mean, like, who talks about Malaysian art, right? But, um, and she, she, she deals with the local politics and um, local environment of, of, of Malaysia. But she's more than Malaysia. I mean, she, she can think Malaysia, she can think Southeast Asia, she can think beyond that. Not because it's fashionable, but she is a singer himself. Ilan is, is, a, is one of those typical cerebral artists. Like she has thoughts and, and philosophy behind her words. This is a work of hers which is on the cover of um, the Contemporary Vision Art and Culture in December 2010. She's basically talking about a, a, a hierarchical group, an, an institutionalized kind of corruption of political hegemonies in, in her hometown in Sabah. Agusuage, an artist from Indonesia. Anki, from Indonesia also. And um, he was one of the cover boy for the Fukuoka Asian Art Triano in 2009. Uyoga, one of the up and coming um, Indonesian artists which I personally like very much. Um, he is very young, as you can see, and he's into installations. This, this is the work itself. So this is, yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost something like for people who's like work in the trade, it's almost, it's, it's, when you walk past and you look at it, it always brings a very warm smile to you. This is like a setup scene, right? It feels like someone just sort of come to the booth and ready to set up by the dealers or the auction house setting up for the previews, etc. But this is his work. So you can see luggages, luggage tag, you know, a Birkin bag, you know, and all the 
things on the floor, you know, works waiting to be unpacked, to be hanged on the wall. It's, it's always with a sense of humor with yoga. So, well, the adjustment of the price of the contemporary Southeast Asian art is certainly not as dramatic. So when you are in a market like in Hong Kong, when it's putting along side by side with like say Chinese, Korean, Japan, it's, it's very tempting. It's, it's, it's also, I can understand, logical for people to comment that, hey, it's, it's, it's stronger, you know, uh, because it didn't drop as much as the rest. But first of all, it's, it was never that big. So it didn't go up to that level for it to drop so high. But certainly, since the 2008-2009 crisis, we did see some adjustment. So like this work of uh, Mars Ready, which was which came out in Christie's after my time, in the first evening sale in Christie's, which, you know, with all the evening sales talks and marketing packaging, they were really expecting a lot more money than 433,000 US dollar, you know. And really, frankly, a lot of people say that, oh, ruling because you're not there, you're not, you know, it's really, no, I'm not trying to be modest. If I had been there, I don't think I can make this painting more expensive than what it did then. Um, and for me, that is a very fair price. And I want to reiterate what many of you said. I personally also feel that the crisis has sort of returned the market to the more healthy trend. I mean, he is a very good artist, but I don't think his work should continuously, especially a wet work, you know, um, make 500, 600,000 US dollar. And I put that up to say, to make one point. First of all, it is adjusted. It, it has been adjusted. And secondly, for me, it's a good adjustment. It's a healthy adjustment. And, um, and thirdly, I just want to say, point out to you that an infuriating point for me and the frustration of someone which is involving in the market is that you would, you would tend to think that you make this work and you think it's a good price and then people will tell you that, oh no, it's actually not good because it should have been 600,000 US dollars and that was what being said in the market. So, because they were comparing to something that sold in 208 for 539,000 US dollars and they say that, oh, you know what, today it should have been more, it should be 600 thousand US dollar. I mean there's really no logic in this kind of expectations, you know. And you certainly cannot compare with this work which then makes six hundred fifty thousand thousand US dollars before the crisis. Just to quickly run through, so right now um, the more recent works that's come into the auctions would be settling between two hundred eighty thousand US dollar to like three hundred thousand US dollar and to many people who are sort of playing in the market, they, they find that very disappointing, which to me is very healthy and very solid. So I would say right now, it's really a more healthier consideration of buying, as many of my esteemed colleagues have mentioned before me. Sorry, I'm rushing through because I've been rushed by someone. Um, so... Just using an example of Rona too, this work of Rona made one million US dollar. And you can imagine, Rona is like, how old is he? He's like 40, early 40s. It was amazing. You know, a, a wet painting came into the auctions and made one million US dollar. And what's going to happen next? Any work that comes after, like this for, in, for instance, which makes about, I think, 400,000 US dollar, was a disappointment. And little considerations was even discussed of made in relation to the size, to the quality of the work. Mm -hmm.